So welcome um, to this lecture. It's a special lecture sponsored by the uh, Burton Sons and Cardiac Science Centre. And it's a great pleasure to have Mike Joyner uh, swing by because he's been out of meeting in Nottingham, I think. Yep. Um, so I've known Mike for a long time. And uh, he, he did his undergraduate work at the University of Arizona uh, and then went on and completed his ND at the same university before moving to the Mayo Clinic in the 80s where he completed all his residency and worked with a very famous uh, British physiologist stroke physician in John Shepherd, uh, who had left Belfast to take up a chair at, at, at uh, I think it was, was it the Mayo First? or yeah, Mayo. Mayo First, yeah, where he had a very distinguished career. So Mike joined the Shepherd uh, lab and has done a lot of fantastic work in uh, human physiology, human pathophysiology, but also he's had a parallel career as a, a popular science writer. Uh, he features regularly in the New York Times, uh, giving opinions. And uh, today is not going to be so much a direct science lecture, but uh, a combination of opinion, uh, a little bit of science, a bit of controversy, uh, and he said to me that he had only really wants to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes maximum. And then um, his partner in crime is Dennis Noble, where they do a Huey and Louie act. Uh, and are quite happy to take some questions uh, because uh, the name of the game is Mike is, is, is going to be quite provocative. If you see the title, Chasing Mendel, um, I guess this is a dress rehearsal before he gives grand rounds tomorrow at John Rackley, uh, where he'll be going into the lion's den to uh, take this on. So we, we actually had a, a bit of a go at this at Experimental Biology in Boston last year. Um, and so for those of you that have seen the YouTube on it, uh, we will rehearse some of that narrative uh, today and see how it goes. So Mike, well, welcome to Oxford and welcome to physiology. Thank you, David. Right, thank you very much, David. Well, we'll uh, just dive right in. And, uh, First, I want to start with a few definitions before we get started. HGP stands for the Human Genome Project. SNP stands for Simple Nucleotide Polymorphism. That's a common DNA sequence variation within a population. Uh, typically, common counts as 1% or more. And GWAS is Genome-Wide Association Study, which has been a very popular uh, or prominent form of studies over the last 10 or so years as people try to unravel the genotype, uh, phenotype uh, issue. So I want to start because I recognize I'm the only person sitting uh, between you and the bar uh, or a drink with the short version. So let's just think about blood pressure. Blood pressure is a wonderful phenotype. It's easy to measure. It can be measured cheaply. And you can, anybody can learn to do it. You don't need a sequencing machine. You don't need any fancy equipment. So this is an old uh, piece of data from uh, Horace Smirk, in his book, Higher Arterial Blood Pressure, written in 1957, the year before I was born. And this is the blood pressure of one identical twin. And this is the blood pressure of the other identical twin. So when you look at data like this, your conclusion is, it's genetic. Now, these are the Kuna Indians who live off the coast of Panama. And you can see here that the Kuna Indians uh, who, who live on an island off the coast of Panama and live in a tight uh, community uh, that's really not particularly modern, in those individuals, there's no age-associated rise in blood pressure, none. So that by age uh, greater than 60, only about 5% of people are hypertensive. Look at the United Kingdom or the US, uh, that number is 60 or 70% by age 60. Now, if some Kuna are either lucky or unlucky enough to move to Panama City, you can see that there's a normal age-associated rise in blood pressure. And then by age 60, 50% are hypertensive. So it's data like this that are a prime argument for environmental factors as determinants of phenotype. And so then the question becomes if it's genetic, how genetic is it? 
So as a result of these GWAS studies, a number of gene variants have been um, discovered, SNPs, associated with a rise in blood pressure. And the interesting thing here on the right in blue is diastolic blood pressure, 0 to 0.8 millimeters, and systolic blood pressure, 0 to 1.2 millimeters of mercury. So the biggest variant, the biggest variant, uh, it's about one millimeter of mercury. One millimeter of mercury. And that's led uh, my colleague, um, Nigel Panic at Michigan State University, who's, a, who's an epidemiologist, has come up with a new metric. It's called the Genomic Futility Index. And it's the number of authors divided by the effect size of the biggest area. And in this case, it's 400 authors to get you one millimeter of mercury. So the Genomic Futility Index for this particular uh, study was 400. But now we're going to step back and try to get into the uh, meat of the talk as we really take a deeper dive into some of the things I just talked about. So how many people here, here know who James Black is? So we've just uh, done a phenotypic test for everybody over 50. <laughs> uh, Black won the Nobel Prize uh, for his, his concepts about modern drug discovery, and he is the uh, person who really figured out how to make uh, uh, an various antagonists uh, for the autonomic nervous system, including histamine antagonists, selective uh, histamine antagonists, which did a lot to cure ulcers uh, before antibiotics was uh, used. And it was realized that, that ulcers had a, a big uh, infectious disease component, but he also discovered beta blockers. And, Black uh, pointed out that reduction has, reductionism has proven to be our most successful analytical tool. Molecular biologists have reduced cells into the huge number of molecular components that are the subject of modern biochemistry, and I see they're building a building across the street. Organisms, tissues, and cells are certainly composed of these molecular components. However, as they interact with each other, they form a system that, like the psychoanalyst idea of Gestalt, is more than the sum of its parts. Components are to systems as words are to poems and pigments are to paintings. The decomposition of poems and paintings into words and pigments is not reversible. So, Black was a bit of a skeptic about reductionism. And as we move to the, the, really the formal part of the talk, with what I've just told you is a, sort of a background, the short version, I want to cover a couple of ideas. First, where did ideas about heritability come from? How did heritability get connected to genetics? Is a gene still a gene? How many people here have heard of the central dogma of molecular biology? Um, I want to point out that despite the central dogma of molecular biology, for many common human phenotypes, like I showed you for blood pressure, DNA isn't that predictive. And Review some concepts about physiological redundancy, and then point out finally that the organism is what confronts the environment versus uh, a single gene. So ideas about heritability. Inheritance is a word borrowed from law and finance. It was a non-biological term until the time of, of, of Darwin, or, or maybe a little bit before that. Uh, we think about nature versus nurture. Uh, Ideas or the controversy about nature versus nurture goes way, way back. You can find discussions of it among uh, the Greeks and in, in things like uh, the Hindu holy books and also the Old Testament. Lamarck, uh, the simple version of Lamarck is he felt that there was transmission of acquired characteristics. The simple idea about Darwin is that there's transmission of inherent characteristics. And that both of those uh, bullet points represent major oversimplifications of their ideas. And then there becomes a much, much bigger problem, is the ongoing problems of missing heritability and so-called soft inheritance. So here's what you have to try to do if you're going to reconcile uh, variability. You have to think about variability uh, both between species and within species. This is the variability of height in women in a population and men in a population, and this is and theoretically, as humans emerge into what we're currently emerging to, or drifting toward. And so you need to be able to explain both of those things as you think about uh, this topic or this problem. So how many people here know who Francis Galton was? Well, you know, it's Francis Galton's world, we just live in it. And I want to uh, try to 
convince you that he's one of the most important people that you've never heard of. So Galton is an English polymath the Victorian, who's Darwin's cousin. He's responsible for weather maps, fingerprints, and I believe it or not, had ideas about digital image analysis. Uh, he was a, one of the founders of a movement known as biometrics, including and, and made massive measurements of heightened intelligence. Uh, anybody here ever done a Fisher exact test or a correlation coefficient? Or a, what am I, something from Pearson? Fisher and Pearson were his students. And I'll show you in a bit that Galton came up with something that looks an awful lot like a correlation coefficient. He's also one of the founders of eugenics. That's got a bad name now. But in the late 1800s, uh, in the Victorian era, we were going to have social hygiene, political hygiene, and why not have a genetic hygiene as well? So there's a huge hygiene movement. And why eugenics has a bad name because of what happened uh, with the Nazis and others, uh, at one point it was just seen as another part of the hygiene movement. And the arguments that he made about, um, about heritability and what might be described, at least a biological explanation for it, really anticipate the current discussions. So, Galton measured a huge number of people and took the average height of the parents versus the average height of the offspring. And this would be a correlation coefficient of one. And it showed that what we would call now that it's about 40% heritable, 40, 50% heritable. Uh, which is a remarkable number uh, from the late um, 1800s. I think this was published in about 1889, yeah. Uh, the current estimates in well-fed people from rich countries is that height is 60, 70, 80% variable, if you know the heights of the parents. Now, in about 1900, Mendel was rediscovered. So Mendel had been around and had done these experiments in the 1870s or the 1880s where he'd been breeding plants. And, uh, then he later went on to be a, uh, an administrator of the monastery. That was all forgotten. It was rediscovered around 1900. And you can see that while you get continuous variation in humans, as I showed you in those slides earlier, and also Galton showed, you get clear distributions in these uh, plants. And this led to some ideas about heritability or a bit of a conflict. And so the, the point is populations show continuous variation. Plant results show clear distributions. And how do you reconcile that? All right, how about Wilhelm Johansson? Anybody here heard of Wilhelm Johansson? Wilhelm Johansson was a pharmacist who got better education, educated living in Denmark. And he did, you can see right here, these are pure line distributions of, of I think, bean size or seed size in, in pure lines of self-fertilizing uh, plants. So he was a Danish scientist. He experimented on variability in pure lines where he had absolute control when they theoretically should have all been clones. He developed the terms genotype and phenotype. Genotype predates chromosomes. Predates chromosomes. They had no idea what it was. They just felt there was something called a genotype. It also predates modern ideas about DNA. And genotype is a black box unit of in biological inheritance. So the first definition of a gene was just a functional unit from uh, Johansson in, um, in, in based on, on what he, his own work and also the work of Mendel's. And this is the pure line experiments in bees. And you can see it's a distribution in animals that should have been a clone, or not animals, plants that should have been a clone. The plants self-fertilize, breed, breed small beans, get a normal distribution, breed lar large beans, and get a normal distribution. And this was published in about 1909, but an English version appeared in 1911. So it's more than 100 years ago. So here's Fisher from the Fisher exact test. So while everybody currently thinks about uh, genetics and, and human health, uh, Fisher actually did a lot of agricultural work. He spent time at Iowa State University, where he uh, developed the statistical test that torture us all, as they were thinking about uh, how they were breeding and crossbreeding different plants and, and studying the yields of those plants. So, in Eugenics Review in 1919, uh, Fisher causes of human variability. So he said if you knew the height of one parent, that gave you a 25% contribution to the height of the offspring. Both parents, you could get about 40%. If you knew all the rest of the ancestors, all qualities of all ancestors, 
height would give you about a 95%. So you should be able to get 95% of the heritability if you know all this information. That was his estimate in uh, 1919. And yet, what do we know? We'll come back to height in a minute. So what happens next is a man named T.H. Morgan discovers chromosomes and flies at various places, but best known as Caltech. Erwin Schrodinger, the, the, the physicist and dentist taught me this, uh, was sitting out World War II in Dublin and gave a talk called What is Life, where he more or less predicted something like DNA existed. Watson and Crick then figure out that, that DNA exists and figure out how it works. But they were predated by a man called Chargoff and a couple of other people who knew something was up with, with the DNA molecules. So a definition of a gene now shifts from a black box cumulative inheritance to a strand of DNA. But ideas about the genotype and phenotype relationship are unchanged. And this leads us to the central dogma of molecular biology, which says it's basically a one-way shoot from DNA to RNA to protein. And this is just what uh, Crick said. Now, if all possible transfers commonly occurred, it would have been almost impossible to construct useful theories. Nevertheless, such theories were part of our everyday discussions. This was because it was uh, being tacitly assumed that certain transfers could not occur. It occurred to me that it would be wise to state these uh, preconceptions explicitly. What I like about the central dogma of molecular biology is it's a medieval uh, religious language. The idea that there's some sort of code or secret that can be broken and, and, and the secret is then revealed. It's read-only information, so there's no feedback. And ultimately, if you extrapolate this a bit, or certainly the way it was extrapolated in the 1960s and 70s, is DNA equals phenotype. And that's where various oversimplifications or expansions of the central dogma uh, led to. So what happens next? Now, we're, now things move along, and by the 1980s, it become clear to at least a few people that you can sequence DNA on an industrial scale. Then we're going to link it to phenotype, in large populations, the common variant, common disease or phenotype hypothesis was advanced. So for something like diabetes, we would find five or 10 variants that explain population risk or individual risk. And if we do enough of this, missing heritability and soft inheritance are solved. And that leads to the human genome project. And this is a, a, a very well-known guy called Leroy Hood, who's one of the founders of systems biology, or at least his definition of systems biology. And this was uh, published in 1988. And Hode has made a lot of contributions to, to sequencing technology. And he saw that you could do these things on an industrial scale. And as he points out here, in 1988, his lab was interested in genetic engineering of the nervous system and the mapping and sequencing of the human genome. And if you think about it, we currently have a brain project. And certainly the human genome project has been completed. So Hood was uh, either predictive or he was influential enough to help make these things happen. So the Human Genome Project starts in the 1980s as people realized this was possible. Uh, how many people here think it was started by the National Institutes of Health at the US? It was started by the Department of Energy. Uh, the Department of Energy felt that the NIH did not have anybody who could do big science. They felt that they had the computing power from um, the Manhattan Project and the big nuclear and energy labs, and that they could do the sorts of science that were, was hypothesis neutral, and it was really an engineering project. So there was a huge fight in the US uh, about who was going to get to do the genome, the, the Department of Energy or the NIH, and they eventually sort of worked it out. But I want to show you some really great quotes from that time. The sequence of the, of the human DNA is the reality of our species. This is Rene DeValco, microbiologist who won the Nobel Prize. Sequencing the human genome is like pursuing the Holy Grail. And my favorite one comes from Dr. Hood himself. We will learn more about human development and pathology in the next 25 years than we have in the past 2000. He said that in 1992. The good news for Dr. Hood is he has about nine months left. <laughs> but he may be running out of time. So we talked about golf revisit. Here's genetic variance and height. I told you about the common disease, common, or the common phenotype, common variant hypothesis. And so literally, there have been hundreds hundreds of uh, genetic variants associated with height in studies of hundreds of thousands, or perhaps even a million people. Uh, you can see that the average effect size is about 
three centimeters. I showed you that variability in height. The normal distribution of height and population for both men and women is about 40 centimeters. So the best you can do is explain about one, maybe two percent of it when you get to some very rare alleles. When people do bioinformatics uh, with this large number of variants and small effect signs, depending on the model they use, they can get to three to 20 percent of height. Three to 20 percent of height. And that's much worse than Galtonian estimates from the bacterium or arrow, which is 40 or 50 percent of height. And currently, you can probably get about 70 or 80 percent of heritability from knowing the height of the parent. So the problem here is height, if you look at the parents, is 60, 70, 80 percent heritable. If you look at the DNA variants, it's perhaps 20 percent heritable. So there's this missing heritability. And this uh, shows you uh, what you get at least with one model. You get four to six percent of the variance if you do genomic profiles of 40, 54 loci, and you get about 40 percent of the variance if you use Galton's technique. So you get about 10 times better. And while things look a little better uh, uh, now, but they don't look a whole hell of a lot better. It's not like they found anything new recently. And the other thing you have to think about, this is a great slide. This is the height, average height of Japan at age 20. This is the year of birth. And you can see that women have gained, I think, about uh, 15 centimeters. And these are uh, the general population. These are typically people that are were in higher socioeconomic status. These are military conscripts, and then the general population, and again, people that were higher socioeconomic status. And the men have gone from just over 160 centimeters to about 172 centimeters. So again, you have to try to factor these sorts of huge uh, population and cultural effects into any sort of basic biology. Now what about um, old people? So these are nonagerians, so people that are 90 or more versus the control populations. And these are number of SNPs that have been associated with cardiovascular disease or cancer. You can see that the total risk alleles are the same. The risk alleles for uh, metabolic disease are the same. And you can see that the cancer risk levels are the same. You can see no difference between the control and the long-lived cases. None. So you can't predict who's going to get old. How about who's going to have a depression? This is a kind of a deep dive here. Um, it is uh, genome-wide analysis in this biggest one conducted. Therefore, we were unable to identify robust and applicable findings. We discussed what this means for genetic research for uh, major depressive disorder. Uh, they point out a few things that did not work. So in addition to problems with effect size, when uh, people attempt to replicate some of these GWAS studies, you have a hard time replicating the major um, SNP variants, or at least the significance of SNP variants when you go from study to study. So effect size and uh, reproducibility are issues. Now, DNA is not that predictive, but that hasn't deterred our friends who make animal models. So they've decided to take some of these risk genes, breed or engineer animal models, make sure that genotype equals phenotype, and sort of engage in a massive self-fulfilling prophecy, which I'm going to talk about next. And at some level, they've been led astray, because if you do GWAS in domestic animals like dogs, a few variants explain almost everything. So in animals that are very inbred, these tools are quite useful. And they, you can find a very limited number of variants that explain a whole lot of the phenotypic differences. So based on that, maybe they're not making such a huge mistake. But on the other hand, if you try to do this in humans, it just does not explain much. So this leads us to the mousetrap. I read this in one of my favorite scientific journals, Slate. And uh, this is actually a terrific series. And I would encourage everybody to use it in Journal Club. And the basic idea is that we have an over-reliance on one species. These animals are overfed and inactive. They have limited or no genetic variability. And this is a sort of reduction is a more stereotypical thinking, perhaps, on four legs. So how many people here think caloric restriction can extend life? Mice. That's true, except it depends on the species or the strain of mice. These are 30 common laboratory strains of mice, and some animals, it, extends life, in some of the strains it reduces life, and there's a male-female difference. So depending on the animal model or the, or the strain of mouse and the gender of mouse, and I didn't put up here the housing conditions, 
you can get uh, caloric restriction causing life extension, you can get caloric restriction causing uh, animals to die more frequently, and so forth. So the point is, for many, many of these things, they're very, very context uh, dependent. How about fatty liver? These are some control mice. These are some animals that have been inbred to get fat and develop fatty liver disease. These are animals that were given caloric restriction. And these are animals that were just given access to voluntary running wheels. Just given access to voluntary. They were not forced to exercise. They were just allowed to go over run at night. And you see the phenotype didn't show up. So what were we studying here? Were we studying the genetics of fatty liver disease? Were we studying what happens when you let the animals either eat too much or become inactive? So what, what again, what are we studying and how context uh, specific are these sorts of things? Now here's my favorite one. These are prodroid mice. Uh, and they have a defect in their mitochondria which leads to massive premature aging. You can see they get heart failure, their skin looks terrible, they get cataracts. Every hallmark of aging occurs in these animals. If you send the animals to the mouse gym and have them uh, do 30 or 40 minutes of exercise every other day, so you don't train them for a marathon, just have them do a bit, the phenotype almost goes away. The phenotype almost goes away. So again, are we studying aging? Are we studying a genetic defect that leads to aging? Are we studying inactivity? What's being studied here? And these sorts of questions have to be answered, or at least thought about. Now the other thing to think about is, uh, what, what temperature in the animal quarters here where, where the mice in it? rats are held. 20, 21 degrees. What's thermal neutral for a rodent? 30. These, these animals are chronically cold stressed and their heart rate's about 100 degrees above, 100 beats a minute above baseline. So if you hold the animals at 30, their heart rates are 250 instead of 350. So we're studying a bunch of rodent models with limited genetic diversity. We've come up with DNA equals phenotype as a self-fulfilling prophecy. These animals are overfed and inactive. They're in a caged environment, usually singly. Uh, they have chronic cold stress and sympathetic activation. So what again is really being studied here? What again is really being studied? Uh, if you think about the limits of this, people have engineered animal models to get Alzheimer's disease and due to a buildup of, of uh, amyloid plaques in their brains. A uh, number, of, number of compounds have been developed that uh, eliminate or reduce the buildup of those amyloid plaques, how many of them are currently approved for use? So there's zero for 240. Uh, that's, that's how many drugs have been tried, zero for 240. So where did ideas about heritability come from? How did heritability get connected to genetics? We talked about that. I mentioned briefly as a gene, gene still a gene and told you how that definition has changed a bit. Tried to link it to the central dogma of molecular biology. Then I want to go over a few more things about DNA redundancy and how the organism confronts the environment. Uh, so why are old school physiologists not so surprised? Remember I showed you the twin study earlier? And we're going to talk a little bit about redundancy and then the twins. So let's say we knock a, a gene out of an animal and the animal has its best up phenotype, or maybe the animal has a normal phenotype and adapts. This is a study from 1964 where they took racing greyhounds and they de innervated the heart of the racing greyhound. This was done because people were getting ready for heart transplantation, and the idea was that if you de innervated the heart of a human, the human might not be able to survive or do much. So they took these dogs, racing greyhounds, de innervated them, and you can see in anticipation of the race, the dog has a huge increase in heart rate from a little over 100 to about 300. The race starts five sixteenths of a mile, and here you go. And you can see nothing happens here, or much, not much in the deeper of the animal, and the heart rate really doesn't pick up until the very end as a result of circulating catecholamines because the animal became so excited. So which of these animals ran faster? The yellow line or the, or, the, or the orange line? How many people vote for yellow? How many people vote for orange? So, so, any, so how about if I told you it made no difference. It made no difference. So you could reduce dramatically the heart rate response of a racing greyhound, do an operation, and five or six weeks later, they could run almost as fast as they could before surgery with a normally innervated heart. So I think that's one of the things as physiologists we've always sort of uh, 
uh, appreciated that there was this tremendous redundancy and if you knock one system out, other things can pick up and compensate. And so, you know, Google says that, that redundant is um, no longer needed or useful, superfluous, or able to be omitted without loss of meaning or function. So there's a whole bunch of redundant physiology. And the synonyms are unnecessary, needless, excess for spare, but this is the definition I like best as a physiologist. So how about the environment and behavior? So this is physiology versus twin studies. Remember, identical twins are exactly alike. Unless one brother becomes a marathon brother, runner, and the other guy decides to go to the gym and pump a bit of iron. So you see these figures where, where twins look or act or have uh, similar phenotypes. But if you find twins that have divergent behavioral patterns, you'll find very, very divergent phenotypes. And a guy called Matt Lay in conjunction with Frank Booth have actually published a little review article on this where they've got a table of about 100 uh, identical twins who decided to do different things. And, and it's quite dramatic, quite dramatic. So how about this? This is one of my favorite ones. And I, I was going to talk to you about redundancy and about how the organism confronts the environment. So this is made the front of the New York Times, Nicholas Wade, 2013. East Asian physical traits linked to 35,000-year-old mutation, gaining a deep insight to human evolution. Researchers have identified a mutation in a critical human gene as a source of several distinctive traits that make East Asians different from other races. More sweaty, thick hair, and smaller breasts. I'm going to focus on more sweaty. So the idea here is that these individuals lived in a warm part of China, that the ability to sweat more improved their ability to thermoregulate, and as a result, they had a survival advantage. And as a further result, uh, this uh, trait became more uh, you know, embedded in the general population. It's a nice story. And this is the actual uh, paper modeling a recent human evolution of mice by expression of selected EDR variant that showed how they did it. High humidity, especially in the summer, has made provided a seasonally selected advantage for individuals better able to functionally activate more increment bands as they sweat more effectively. But how many people think that you want to sweat a lot in a humid environment? If you sweat too much, you don't evaporate anything, you just get dehydrated faster. And there's actually a concept known as wasted sweat. Sweating's a great, great strategy if it's hot and dry. Sweating's a double-edged sword if it's hot and humid. And so, you now let's talk a little bit about this. So this is data from Sid Robinson, collected in the Harvard Fatigue Lab in 1943. The Harvard Fatigue Lab was in the business school. It was not an exercise physiology lab, it was a work physiology lab because they wanted to understand how people worked in factories and in the military so they could become more economically productive. They were not interested in trying to make elite athletes. They were just trying to make sure that factory workers had enough to drink. And they were concerned about what happens when you send Caucasians to the jungle to fight in World War II. So they took uh, five uh, subjects, I wouldn't exactly call them volunteers, <laughs> and they had them uh, put their army uniforms on. They put them in a, a room that was around 100 degrees Fahrenheit and about 40% humidity, and they had them walk for a couple of hours. And you could see that their rectal temperature was about 104 at the end of the first day, and their heart rates were about 190. So they were quite warm. And uh, in appreciation for their hard work that first day, they got to come back and do it again the next day, and the next day, and the next day. So they did this every day for about uh, 24 days, and they kept making these measurements, and you can see, and a few of them went way out to, to, to after two weeks, you can see that the temperature came down, the heart rate came down, and they adapted, and they adapted. What do you think happened to their sweat rates? They didn't measure sweat there, but this is another great study from the South African Bureau of the Mines. So the mines in South Africa, the gold mines, got deep enough in the 1950s that, that they got worried they were getting hot down there. And they thought, well, maybe we should air condition the mines. So, and the, the mine workers, uh, typically, as you might imagine, uh, people doing uh, heavy labor were black in South Africa. And so what they did is they uh, took individuals and they set up an ergometer system, much like shoveling. 
And they measured their sweat rate and then tried to acclimate them over two or three weeks, just like uh, uh, Robinson did. And you can see the average rectal temperature versus sweat rate in unacclimatized humans. You get to 104. You get only about 2.1 um, liters per four hours. If you um, acclimate people, you get 3.5. So you can double the sweat rate almost. And what did they conclude from this? They concluded that if these individuals needed salt and water, not air conditioning. So they didn't air condition the mines in South Africa. And this just even shows uh, what happens to sweat gland function. These are individuals, uh, this is dose response curves to acetylcholine, uh, pre acclimation and post acclimation. This is just a control group. And you can see that things really take off. And again, you sweat a lot more. This is from Chris Minson's group. So, who needs gene variants when the range of acclimation is so high? Multiple studies show young people from any ethnic group acclimate just fine. Uh, the concept of wasted sweating was certainly missed in the, uh, in the article about the EDR variant. And there's no good animal and human thermal regulation because humans uh, sweat and we 50% of our body surface area is exposed to the sun or the, the wind as opposed to animals which are quadrupeds. So, anyways, this time prompted me to make an alternate Indian. I read high humidity, especially in the summer, yada, yada, yada. My alternate Indian is, or the alternate Indian, is to explore this hypothesis, greater understanding of the physiology of heat acclimation is needed by the OMICS community. I said that at a large national meeting, and people got, uh, we were able to show that rises or increases in blood pressure could have a non genetic influence as well, as we got acute pressure responses from some of our colleagues. And this leads me back to James Black, who said reductionism in biology merely replaces one type of complexity by a different kind of complexity. And I think it was Dennis who, 20 years ago, uh, got this quote out of uh, Sir James. He said, in the 21st century, we'll see the progressive triumph of physiology over molecular biology. So my conclusion is that physiology causes nothing, but perhaps explains everything. And we'll leave this for the discussion and just simply say, is this a private fighter? Can anyone join? Thank you.